Hello, my name is Laura Boone. I am an avid romance reader and also an author of contemporary romance. And for this reason, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Leonie Kelsall and Sandy Docker to this session of a romantic rendezvous locked down in 2020. Hello, ladies. Hi. Hello. Now, I'll give you a bit of background information on Sandy and Leonie, and then they'll tell you a bit about their new books. So Sandy grew up in Coffs Harbour and first fell in love with reading when her father introduced her to fantasy books as a teenager. Her love of women's fiction began when she first read Jane Austen for the HSC, but it wasn't until she was taking a translation course at university that her Mandarin lecturer suggested she might have a knack for writing and obviously also for languages. Um, and that was the seed of an idea that sat quietly in the back of Sandy's mind while she lived overseas and traveled the world. Now back in Sydney, S Sandy writes about love, loss, family, and small country towns. Her debut novel, The Kookaburra Creek Cafe, was released in 2018. And the translation in German was released earlier this year. The Cottage at Rosella Cove came out in 2019, and her third novel, The Banksia Bay Beach Shack, was just recently released this year. Leonie was fortunate enough to grow up in South Australian country, initially on the beautiful Fleurio Peninsula in a tiny town where the school had only 11 students. Later on a sheep and wheat farm in the Murray lands between the Mount Lofty Ranges and the stunning Murray River. However, in typical teen fashion, she couldn't wait to hit the bright lights of the big city when she graduated. A couple of years later, after working in government departments, including the State History Trust and the Education Department, she was longing to make her way back to the country. Through a circuitous route, she now finds herself splitting her time between her home and professional counseling practice in the beautiful Adelaide Hills, and the farm where she grew up. She feels she definitely has the best of both worlds. But Leonie also writes as Lainey K. That's where you'll find all the steamy stuff, as well as women's fiction, her new release, and romantic suspense. Taken at the beach, with an inscription on the back that says, Laura and Gigi, Sisters of Summer, Banksy Bay, 1961. And there are two things that Laura always knew about the grandmother that raised her, and they are that she hated the beach and that she never had a sister. So Laura travels to the sleepy beachside town of Banksia Bay to try to uncover the secrets of Lillian's past. And she meets a whole bunch of eclectic locals, including the owner of the beach shack, Virginia, who Laura suspects holds the key to unlocking the secrets of the past. What Laura uncovers is a story of two unlikely friends of Lily and Gigi and a series of devastating events that not only change the lives of those two young women, but of those around them and future generations. As Laura pieces together the fragments of that fateful summer from 60 years earlier, Virginia has to decide whether to hold on to her secrets or set out the truth free, and Laura has to decide just how high a price she's willing to pay to uncover it all. And it, for me, is a story of first love and last chances and of the truths and the lies that impact people across time. Sounds fascinating. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Leonie, what about your new novel, yeah. which is called The Farm at Pepper Tree Crossing? There. And uh, I'm going to read the elevator pitch because I'm a writer, not an actress, so I can't remember lines. So 30 year old Ronnie's the product of the foster system where it's gone sadly awry as it sometimes does. She's streetwise, she's prickly, she's defensive and above all else she's hurting as she's struggling to carve out an existence in Sydney. She's facing an unexpected pregnancy, she's about to become homeless and jobless. The only bright spot in her life is her rescued street cat scriptures. However, one letter could change everything for her. Meanwhile, in South Australia, rural matriarch Marion faces her mortality with her customary forthrightness. Deciding to right the wrongs done by her family, she bestows her estate upon her estranged niece, Ronnie. However, it's no simple inheritance. 
Marion's seeking to control her legacy from beyond the grave. And she set tasks, which actually disguise life lessons that Ronnie must complete before she can inherit the property, which might change her future. Ronnie plans to sell the farm and return to Sydney, but her decision is complicated, didn't see that coming, did we? By an unexpected friendship with her aunt's life partner, a reluctant attraction to the farm manager, Matt, who inexplicably seems to believe he has a claim to the farm and is clearly hiding secrets of his own, and by the appearance of the mother who surrendered her to the foster system. Slowly unearthing the secrets of dark secrets hidden within the tiny rural community, Ronnie must somehow work out how to survive the betrayal, the heartbreak and the loss if she's eventually to find joy. Above all, she must learn to believe in the truth of Marion's most important lesson, which is that everyone deserves love. Wow, I think I'm going to need a big box of tissues for both your books. <laughs> yeah, that could be the case. Well, now, tonight, today's session is an Ask Me Anything uh, mm -hmm. session. And so um, I am going to ask our first member of the audience, Malvina, if um, she would like to go ahead and ask her question. Hello. Hi, <laughs> I've got a question for each of you. Um, I'll start with Sandy. Um, your books are charming and warm and with that dual timeline, um, how important is melding that past and present to you? Hi Melvina, thank you for your question. Yeah, for me it seems to be my natural place to write. Leonie has known me since before either one of us ever looked like getting published. So she's she's read quite a few of my manuscripts and I'm sure she would agree. It, it just where it seems to be where I fall naturally. I am fascinated by how the past can influence our present, even if we don't realise it. And that's something that I like to explore in my books. And I've done it in all three of them, as you said, and I'm going to be doing it with the next one as well. And it's fun as a writer to go back into those periods in history. I've gone back into World War II, I've gone back into the 60s, the next one I go back into the 50s. And just that that interplay of the two timelines I find really fascinating both as a writer and a reader. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, Leone, you've got a few different strands to your writer's brand by the books of things. Three, three different kind of books? Um, oh gosh, there's probably more. I've got about 14 or 15 titles out. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been, I haven't read any. Um, so I was just going to ask you if this book is a change of pace for you in any way. Uh, this book is where my heart lies. Um, the others do span genres, including. Um, fantasy, light science fiction. Some I wrote with um, a co-author who's a very good American friend. Um, there's erotic romance in the others. There's contemporary romance in the others. But rural romance is where my heart lies. It's where my roots are. I grew up in the country. And it's writing about what really gives me joy. Was that... Um something that came really chilly where you are now Wiener. pardon it must be really chilly where you are you keep freezing oh, <laughs> oh that's my anyway <laughs> um I, I just um wondered if that was a surprise when you you wrote th this new book was it a surprise to me yeah what or no, why no. did you start that way or, or no not at all um okay I, I wrote the others because there was a market for them. I was actually in the American market. I was okay. um, have an American agent and I was trying for American publishers, which I had some success with. And it's a very different product that you sell to America than you sell here. Um, the rural oh. romances are for Australians. I write them for Australians. Um, it's by an Australian for Australians about Australia. And that's where I want to keep my focus. The others are just sort of, fun, easy to write. Well, on that note, I might actually ask Shell Parsons to join us because I know that her question is similar. 
Hello. Enjoying tonight's event. Apologies about the audio. I thought it was pretty muted. So I'm just having a chat. Um, my question, I'm trying to remember it because I did type it in before I went to it. I think it was basically what part of the writing process most. And while I was sitting here, I actually thought of another question. Seeing as you and Sandy are both beta readers for each other, and I've been lucky to be beta readers for both of you, what is your five tips for, or well, let's say three tips, when you're being a beta reader, how you give feedback when things are a little tricky? Oh, she's giving us tough ones now. Yeah. And see, like, there were so many questions there. I already forgot the first part. Um, what, was the, what was the best part of the process, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I like editing, but that's because my edits are generally pretty light when they come back from the publisher, so it's not a huge task and it's just tidy. And knowing that somebody else has had their eyes on it and you're not at the stage where you're writing the original manuscript and you're going, does this even make any sense? You've got past that hurdle. So, yeah, editing's my thing. Um, I, I find joy in every part of the process. And when I'm in that part of the process, that's the process that I like the most. So when I'm first starting a new manuscript, I find a lot of joy in discovering who the characters are and what the story will be. But then when I'm in the editing process and I'm in that now for next year's novel, I think, oh, that was awful having to create it. Now I love editing it because I'm making it more beautiful. Uh, and then when that part's finished, then I love promoting it. So, so I'm kind of um, I'm a bit of a fair-weathered friend, I guess. <laughs> I like the bit that I'm in currently. So. Terrific. And advice for giving... Sorry, Shia, what was that? And your advice for when you're giving feedback as a beta reader, how do okay. you... Um, tactfully... Compliment yeah. sandwich, always a compliment sandwich. Um, so to be fair, Sandy and I, because we do a lot of each other's stuff, we're in a rush now, aren't we? So we tend not to be quite as nice as we used to. But I also mentor um, quite a few writers through United States competitions. So yeah, uh, compliment sandwich. Be very careful not to tell somebody to rewrite something just because that's the way that I would do it. You know, you've got to remember that it's their book. And that's probably, I only have two pieces of, of advice because I think they're probably the most me. That's good. Yeah, and probably the, the biggest thing I would add to that is you have to be honest. And that's actually a really hard thing to do when you're a, a beta reader or a critique partner. And it takes an awful lot of trust to be able to do that. The very first friend I gave my very first manuscript to read, I said to her, what are you going to tell me if you actually don't like it? And she panicked because she didn't know what she would say if she didn't like it. So you have to have that rapport with somebody. And Leonie and I were lucky enough to find each other very early on. And so we've kind of gone through the journey together and we understand it quite a lot. We understand what each other's going through. But you have to be honest. There's no point telling me everything's perfect because it's not. Nobody's is ever perfect. Um, but there's ways to deliver that honesty. And I think that's the thing. And that's the, the trick to being a really good beta reader or critique partner. And, and you do that, Shell, and, and Leonie certainly does it. You can be really honest with somebody if you don't like it, but there's a way to deliver it. It has to be constructive um, and you have to be able to justify why you felt that way. You can't just say, oh, I hated Tom in your book. You have to be able to put that in a way that, you know, perhaps, you know, I didn't feel his motivation or... You know, he felt a little, you know, held back to me or whatever it might be. So, yeah, being honest but doing it in the right way would be the only thing I'd add to that. Excellent advice. And congratulations, both of you. Love your books. Thank, Thank you, Shell. Thank you, Shell. Uh, I know the guys at Happy Valley Books have a whole series of questions for you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask them to get started and fire away. Hi. Hey, guys. Hi, Greg. Hi, Phil. Congratulations to both both of you on such great books. As um, mentioned, we do have a few questions. They're nice, quick, easy, fun questions. Um, we, we left the hard ones to the previous people. Um, the first question we've got is, which book have you read that you've loved that you wished you had written? So it's a question for both of you. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one to answer, guys, because um, as a writer, we bring our own experiences and our own flavour to what we write. So, um, you know, if I was to answer that question, I would probably say The Red Tent by Anita Diamond. 
which is a historical fiction novel. But I know if I had written it, there's no way I would have done anywhere near as good a job as she did, and I'd probably ruin it. So in theory, it's, it's okay to answer, but it, the reality, I think, you know, I can't write anyone else's book because so much of ourselves is in it. But that book, that one, oh, in my heart forever, that one. Oh, nice. I'm a hugely diverse reader. I, I don't read the genre that I'm writing in at any time, which may actually be a mistake. Um, so what I would have liked to write would depend on what I'm reading at any given time. You know, that could be Wilbur Smith that I'm reading. Um, obviously, it could be Sandy's book. Yes, I'll save all of your books, Sandy. That would be good. Um, Anne McCaffrey. I would love to have been able to write like Anne McCaffrey did in the earlier books before she started co-writing because just her world building was phenomenal. Um, but, you know, that said, it could be in a blight and next week that I want to write like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, another question is, which author do you guys fangirl over, whether it be Australian or overseas? Leonie, do you want to take that one? Yeah, look, again, I don't think I really fangirl because um, obviously I'm not very faithful. I just like, <laughs> I'm all over the place. I like different people at different times. So yeah, I honestly don't think, except for Sandy. I love Sandy, obviously. <laughs> she gives me chocolate and things. So you know. I do. I send chocolate to Leone, um, you know, across the, across the States so to keep yep. her in my good books. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, fangirling. I mean, I love everyone I read. I love. And, um, you know, I love meeting authors. I go to a lot of author talks myself and I always have that moment of, oh, I'm at this author's talk. And then I have to remind myself that that's other people for me as well, which is a really strange experience. But probably week at the knees the most at was when I got to see Marion Keys last year when she came to Sydney. <laughs> Um, I've read, you know, so many of her books and she was one of the first women's fiction writers that I fell in love with. And to meet her in person, that woman is the most hilarious person I have ever met. And just the way she tells her story with her Irish lilt and the, the catchphrases she used, it was feck this and, you know, all sorts of things. And she was hilarious. So I, I think that was probably my biggest fangirl moment to date. Oh. Sounds good. Thank you. Another question is, if a royal could have a cameo in any one of your books, who would it be, past or present? <sighs> you want to take that one first, Leone? Okay. Um, well, you guys just read my book, or at least one of you have read it. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, for the role of Aunt Marion, Camilla Parker Bowles. But we'd ha obviously have to have an Australian accent. What do you think? I think Camilla, yes. Yeah. Prince Charles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, potentially. <laughs> I could so see the Queen marching around there with her um, umbrella as well. <laughs> Hurting the chooks. <laughs> uh, see, now I'm going to be a bit cheeky and say just because I want to actually meet them myself, I would cast the Queen in any role she wanted. In any <laughs> I think... What that woman must know and what she must have seen in her reign yeah. would be amazing. And she wouldn't tell me, I know that, but maybe if I slip her a few gin and tonics or something, we might get a few secrets out of her. I think she would be fascinating. So purely so I can get to meet her, I'd have her cast in any role she likes. Oh, I, I'm probably with you on that one as well. Um, another question, if you could go back to a certain time in history to live, when would it be? That one, Sandy? Yeah. Um, I mean, you guys have read my book, so you know I do like going back into um, historical periods and exploring them. And and a bit like Leone with her switching genres every you know, moment in terms of what she's reading, I would switch back to any period in history. You know, I'd love one of those time machines that could take you back to all of them and see what it was like during the dinosaurs and the cavemen and, and stuff. But if I had to pick one time period, maybe the 20s, I just want to see what it was really like, you know, and I, there's no one in my life anymore that lived through that period. And so I would like to see that period myself. 
Good choice. I'm going to say um, in the farm at Pepper Tree Crossing, there's actually um, a character who alludes to having a previous storyline several times, who you may or may not have noticed. Her story actually starts in 1870 in a young adult book that I've written that's a dual timeline. So I'm going to say I'd like to go back to 1870s South Australia because I've researched it so intensely. I feel like I lived it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions if we've got time. Um, uh, what is your favourite cocktail? Well, <clears throat> hang on. I'm going to look at my teenager and ask her, what is my favourite cocktail? She said my ties, my ties, she said, because I don't know. I'm put a glass in front of me, I'll drink it, whatever. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. <laughs> oh dear. And it's amazing that we can be friends, Leonie, because I'm the exact opposite. I don't drink at all, guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know as a writer that's um, probably sacrilegious to admit that I don't drink. Um, so I would have to say like a hot chocolate would be my... You don't even drink coffee, do you? Sandy? With marshmallows. It has to have marshmallows, though. What about an Earl Grey? Uh, no, I don't actually do tea either. <laughs> I know, I know. Shoot me now. Shoot me now. <laughs> oh, dear. And just one last question. Um, if you were stranded on a deserted island, what one book would you take? Just one? Yes, that's, just that's one. That's cruel. That's cruel. <laughs> do we pick something that's going to entertain us or do we pick like a how to build a raft manual? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Oh, either, a, either a how to build a raft manual <laughs> <laughs> or um, maybe the Outlander series, because they're going to last a long time. <laughs> no. Sounds I, good. I feel like I should be like, really erudite and say, so, you know, Lord of the Rings or something, but um, I honestly, honestly don't know, um, because I like to pick up books by authors I've never even read and get involved and sort of read a couple of chapters and then go to bed and dream could happen which kind of throws me when I pick up the book again because I'm going, what, what, what? that's not what happens. I don't know what happens. So <laughs> I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> Maybe Fair I enough. Thank you, guys. Thing. If Leonie's not taking any books, I can take two, The Raft <laughs> and Outlander. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And well Thanks, done again on guys. the book. Yes. Thanks yeah. for those lovely questions. <laughs> Um, I do have one question uh, from Helen Sibbert in Absentia, and um, she's asked how long it takes you to write a book, and if you find it difficult to let go of the characters uh, when you finish writing the book, um, and it's a sort of three-part question, and the final bit is, um, do you um, need a break in between books, or do you always have characters in your head that you... Uh, need to immediately start on their stories? Okay. Um, my answer would be it varies massively. I've written two books in 30 days each that were 90,000 words each, and that's because they just sort of came fully formed. However, Malicious Desire, which you can see behind me, took 20 years to write because I actually wrote it longhand twice because you know, this was back before computers, people. And the story just kept evolving in my mind. And by the time I actually wanted to publish it, things had changed. There were things like mobile phones in the world, which changed the way the story had to go completely. So, you know, that's the longest one. Now it probably takes me about three to four months from go to go. Go to go. It takes me three or four months to finish a book anyway. Um, what was the other parts of the question? Can you let go of your characters easily? Yeah. Uh, again, depends on the book and how invested I am, whether I'm writing just a quick contemporary romance that's going to be spicy. Yes, characters are gone. That's it, done. Um, other books like Pepper Tree Crossing, I'm a lot more invested in the characters. I've discovered the layers to them and they're never really gone. 
that said, I can move on to the next book quickly, but then my books in rural romance are all set in the same area. So you have the same characters pop into each story. So I never have to say goodbye. <laughs> what about you, Sandy? <laughs> yeah, I'm the same as Leone in that it varies how long it takes to write. And for me, it was pre-publishing and post-publishing. Before I was published, um, I think Kookaburra took me three years to write. Rosella took me five years to write. Banksia Bay was five months because I was actually contracted and on a deadline and I had to get it done. Um, so I have discovered that I can write a book in about five to six months now, which, um, which is a lot quicker than I ever used to work before. Um, I have a little bit of trouble letting them go. They really do become part of our lives. You know, when, when you're talking about these characters that have inhabited your head for so long and then you've nurtured them and brought them to life on the page and, and it can be a bit sad to say goodbye to them. Uh, but the third part of the question, yeah, I, I tend to need a break between books um, in terms of writing because I need to switch my mind set. When I was writing Banksia Bay, I hadn't long finished doing the promotion for Rosella Cove and I kept writing Rosella Cove every time I was writing a place name because I hadn't made that mental break between the two. So, um, yeah, having a mental break between the next one I think is a really good idea. But um, Helen has hit it on the head with her question in that, are the characters always in our minds? Absolutely. There are always characters in our mind. They might not be the ones we're writing right now, might be one for a future book. But, um, you know, I always say that a psychiatrist would have a field day looking inside of a, the mind of a writer because there's a whole world of people in there that's very, very messy. Well, thank you very much, ladies. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm going to remind everyone that we're having a treasure hunt this weekend. So if I could ask you each to hold up your card, uh, your lockdown card with your code clearly visible so that the audience has a chance to write it down. And perhaps starting with Sandy, um, could you just remind us where we could find you online? Sure. Um, my website is www.sandydocker.com and I hang out a fair bit on Facebook, which is at Sandy Docker Writer and Instagram at Sandy Docker. And you, Leonie? Uh, you can find me at www.leoniekelsall.com and all my Instagram and Facebook and Twitter accounts are all listed on there so you can just click straight through. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, I'm sure our readers are going to love getting to know you and read your books. <laughs>